So I have the distinct pleasure of standing between you all in happy hour, so I'm going to keep this short and sweet. <laughs> I'll definitely um, talk about my uh, iGuard experience because when I got the um, request to, to come and talk about interdisciplinary research and integrated research, I was so excited because I really am a product of an iGuard program. Um, so I'll talk about that at the end, and I'll also talk about our foundation, a little bit about FAR, what we are what we do, and then how we invest in our Fostering the Future Special Initiative, which is really looking at workforce development, how we can retain and attract these um, discipline, interdisciplinary projects um, and, and attract um, more talent into agriculture. So let's see. We're going to do it like that. There we go. So a little bit about our foundation. The Foundation of Agriculture, um, Food and Agriculture Research was created in 2014 by the Farm Bill um, by, non, by um, bipartisan congressional support. Uh, and we're governed by a board of directors and advised by expert councils. And we are created to be complementary and not duplicative to the work of USDA. That is not what we were supposed to do, but we're going to keep doing it. <laughs> so part of the farm model is we were created to be both flexible and nimble and to double taxpayer investment. So some of the challenges in agricultural research specifically is that there's just not enough resource. So the idea is that um, we're created to double that resource and to leverage additional resources and to try to collaborate with public and private sector partners in order to increase the pot and in, in order to leverage existing resources to try to fund unique innovative new projects in order to meet our mission and our vision. And our vision is, um, for FAR, we want to envision a world in which ever innovative and collaborative science provides every person access to affordable nutrition food, nutritious food grown on thriving farms. And we do that through our unique partnerships in trying to support innovative um, science. And we look at um, addressing today, and, and it's today's food and agricultural challenges, but also the future's um, agriculture and food challenges. So we have uh, $200 million we received from the Farm Bill. And with that, we are charged with a dollar-to-dollar -dollar match of non-federal funds. So we often seek diverse groups that might not often um, collaborate in this space. So we very often seek groups that typically aren't in agriculture. We really love to see different groups that are outside of agriculture come to agriculture, or groups that typically don't work together. So we really encourage collaboration. We love to see groups come together and work on projects to try to solve agricultural issues. We love to try to find those white spaces and research gaps that exist and then fund in those spaces. Um, we tend to fund in these seven challenge areas. So these are our seven challenge areas. These are our strategic priority areas, but we will also fund what we call special initiatives, which are areas that we think are extremely important, but they're not necessarily in these particular areas. And Fostering the Future is one of those special initiatives, and that's kind of the umbrella under which our workforce um, development, workforce funding comes under that. Uh, let's see. So to date, um, even though the foundation was founded in 2014, technically it wasn't fully staffed until about 2016. So in the year and a half that I've been there, I'm one of the oldest members of the foundation now. Um, but to date, we've managed to award 77 grants, $105 million in matching funds leveraged, and over 100 contributors and co-funders. So we've been very busy in the last year and a half funding a lot of projects and then forming a lot of collaborations and partnerships. So it's been a very exciting year and a half. And this is just a, a short or small example of some of the partners that we've managed to work with um, over time in either their donors or matching funders to projects that we have developed. And to that end, we strive to catalyze transformative real world results. We love um, and welcome creative partnership models and research designs. We want to challenge the status quo and we want to produce knowledge that benefits our end users. And we're always extremely focused on the producer. We're always very focused on our farmers. Whenever we have events and we're trying to identify research gaps in white spaces, we always try to ensure that we have producers and farmers in the room so that we can actually talk to them about what they need as we develop these projects. So we often try to have as many of the stakeholders as possible in the room when we're thinking about how we develop projects and programs and how they can be of use. 
So a lot of the things that I spend time doing is looking at 2050. And so I think we all know the numbers and 9.7. And I've, I recently was in a meeting where it says closer to 10 billion um, people that will need to feed by 2050. And so I often think when I'm we're developing projects or we're thinking about what needs to be funded, what do we need to invest in now? in order to be prepared for that future, right? So what do we need to invest in? Not just what type of research, but also what workforce do we need to invest in? So that's a lot of the time that I think about those types of projects and what what's the research, what's the innovation, what's the technology that's needed in order to address those challenges of increased population, decreased resources, and increased need for productivity. And one of the, this is just something I came across that I really thought was interesting when I was looking up information for my talk. And it was like, it says that at the intersection of white spaces and demand that opportunity exists. And I really think that that is what FAR feels like for me. We sit in that space where we look for white spaces and research gaps. And then we work with industry and our public private partners to figure out where that demand is. And then we seek out those opportunities. So I feel as though that's a lot of what we get to do. And it's really exciting to do that. And a lot of what we do surrounding that or what we've been doing in our Fostering the Future initiative is trying to identify what those white spaces are um, in funding or research or dollars for training and then what the opportunities are that exist. So I'll share some of those white spaces and I'll go through those pretty quickly because I think most people have said the same things. So um, the major thing is that was my mistake but we'll be okay. <laughs> um, the major thing is there are um, more jobs or more opportunities for funding than there are actually trained professionals in the agricultural sciences right now. Um, a lot of the times when we hear from our stakeholders is that over time there are more and more opportunities in STEM. This is a laundry list, but I managed to pull a number of things in each of these um, opportunities are things that kind of fit in our challenge areas. So for example, there'll be a strong demand for food scientists and technologies and new product development. There'll be a, a strong demand for expertise in the production of sustainable products made from wood, wood and biomaterials um, with the concerns surrounding evolving water use and availability, especially in the western um, states. There'll be a heightened demand for watershed scientists, hydrologists, irrigation engineers, and plant geneticists. So clearly there's a demand and a need for additionally trained folks in these spaces. But then beyond that, beyond the need for folks trained in that space, you also need people that are trained in research that cuts across these disciplinary lines. And that's even more prominent. Um, you need folks that are trained both in basic and applied science, and you need discoveries and technologies that continue to change the way we think about problems. As uh, people talked about earlier, Many of the challenges we face in agriculture and in the environmental challenges, they're wicked problems. They're not cut and dry. They need this much more complex way of thinking about things, this much more integrated way of thinking about things. And so it's imperative that we train um, a science-based workforce that's equipped to solve these types of challenges now. And we need to emphasize this need for innovative research educational models. And as these problems are inherently more challenging and complex, we need folks that are, I love this term, this, these renaissance people, these scientists that have kind of aspects of multiple disciplines. And as a person who is trained that way myself, I find it very useful in the way that I live my life. Um, I find that um, it makes, it makes the ways in which, if nothing else, even though I often feel that I'm a jack of all trades and not necessarily a master of any, I do have the opportunity to communicate and understand the potential for collaboration in some ways that I think very often um, my more traditionally trained cohorts may not see that um, because I was just trained to work more collaboratively. And then when we speak to our industry partners, um, they need more nimble problem solvers. And also, another thing that we've noticed that we've heard from our industry stakeholders is that they need um, graduates that have um, non-cognitive skills. They need soft skills. If they're going into industry, they need a different set of skills. They need skills that are beyond the bench. And so how can we then fund that? So it's very often, as the slides were shown earlier, a majority of students won't go into academia after they finish. So how can they be prepared for that? That. How can we ensure that they're prepared to um, step into those roles? And 
Um, I'm sure everyone may have seen this leaky stem pipeline. So at the end of this, the reason I thought this was interesting is you have such a small amount of graduates that come out in STEM, but then you overlap that and you think about the number of those graduates that then will be women or people of color. It's an even smaller amount, right? So then how do you work through that? How do you then encourage um, also increase the amount of diversity that that is um, in STEM. And if you look at that 2050 or 2060 number, you find that the U.S. population by 2060, majority um, minorities will account for 56% of the U.S. population. So it's even more important now to increase the number of minorities in those um, positions because you want your profession, your agricultural professionals to reflect the population at large, right? But currently, unfortunately, it does not as um, we have White males constituting about one half of scientists and engineers and the majority of early career doctorate holders being 78% white. And then um, blacks being upper, underrepresented in STEM occupations as well as Hispanics. So it's just in, in thinking through that 2050 number, it's not just thinking about what research needs exist, thinking about how important it is to have people that look that represent the country as a whole in the room. Um, I'll tell an anecdotal story. I remember being at a meeting when I was working at USDA, and we were talking about the SNAP program, and there's a room full of people and that had never known anyone that used SNAP or had been exposed to SNAP, and yet they were making decisions on SNAP. And so I'm a person that <laughs> maybe I have not you snap, but being a single, being raised by a single mother that was very close to the poverty line, I knew a lot of people that had access to SNAP, and I understood how SNAP worked. So it was just a whole lot of conversation about how SNAP works, and there was a lot of misunderstanding about what people do with their SNAP cards. I was like, that is not what people do. They are not, <laughs> that is not what they're doing on, on the first of the month. I'm sorry. They're not all out there buying lobster. It's not what's happening. But it's just this idea that when you have a different set of life experiences, you bring that those series of life experiences to the table, and you bring that experience with you, and that helps to inform you. And so if you're a scientist, that is, in the end, in a position where you're informing policy or informing the way that things are designed, you'll just have a different perspective. And I think that it's important to have multiple perspectives in the room. Um, so I think what we're hearing at FAR so far <laughs> is um, <laughs> that there's a, a huge white space surrounding investment in diversity, attracting and maintaining talent. There's a need to leverage public and private partners to increase the amount of um, investment in agriculture. And then there are specific needs in certain disciplines for inter interdisciplinarily trained um, professionals. So areas around big data, areas around, um, so there's a huge need for computer scientists that actually understand agriculture because what we have is a lot of computer scientists that go into ag but they don't have any understanding of agriculture. So now that we have all this push towards precision agriculture, we get a lot of feedback from our stakeholders saying they would love to have some really trained computer scientists that can do programming, that understand bioinformatics, but that also truly understand agricultural systems, and they just can't find anyone. And it's really hard when they put out postdoc positions, they can't they can't hire anyone, and that's unfortunate. So to that end, we've started thinking about several initiatives through our Fostering the Future special initiative, where we're looking at this critical need to um, fund a strong, diverse, and creative workforce, and we want to um, support both the attraction and retention of future innovators. So we funded a number of programs that I'll run through quite quickly um, just to talk about how we can um, fund not only brilliant minds but fresh perspectives. So a number of the programs that we tend to invest in, we seek out not only new minds in agriculture, but also collaborations from different fields. So we love to see um, people apply to things or, or come to us with projects where they're collaborating with someone from not even an agricultural background. And so we see them partnering and thinking about things in a new way. And we find that exciting. Um, so one of the projects that we, have fund, we fund is a, not, a NAS Prize in Food and Science Agriculture. And this is for our retention. And this is um, for a prestigious media career recognition. It's a endowed in perpetuity. It's a $100,000 prize through the um, National Academies of Science, and it's uh, co-funded with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we thought that there needed to be some sort of way to reward mid-career scientists because it's a hard time to 
it's it's hard to retain that talent, right? You want they sometimes will want to leave for um, industry or leave for other um, opportunities. And then another project or program that we started was early career awards that we call it our new innovator and in food and agriculture research award and that supports the next generation of scientists they have to be within i believe five years of completing their um obtaining their position and um we look to fund them and those recipients are committed to mentoring and pursuing innovative research in one or more of far challenge areas so we run that program um every year and that's the opportunity for relatively new uh, faculty that maybe don't have as they can't compete necessarily with more established um, faculty for funding so it's specifically for new faculty to come in and win awards and the ability to win funding so that they can have um, a little bit more creative freedom to fund projects that maybe they typically wouldn't work on because we do like to fund projects that are a little bit more innovative a little bit riskier so we look for things that are a little bit pushing the envelope a bit. So if they can come up with some ideas that are within our challenge area, they want to collaborate in a unique way, they can apply for our, um, our new innovator award and then if awarded. And then in attracting talent, we have our FAR Fellowship Program, which we recently funded here at NC State, actually. I think John Dole has left, but Re Rebecca's in the back. And um, that particular program will fund 48 graduate students over three years. And that particular project is looking to promote the next generation of food and agricultural scientists. But one of the things I find most interesting and most exciting about this particular program is it provides each of the students with a residential week in the summer where they learn soft skills. And it also pairs them with an the industry mentor. So they have the opportunity to gain those um, softer skills and to work with the industry mentor throughout the year so that they have the opportunity to work as a cohort, learn additional skills. They definitely are working on projects that within, are within our challenge area, but they are also gaining additional sets of skills that will make them very marketable in industry. And the last project that we're in the process of developing is we heard a number of um, comments from stakeholders concerning, as I mentioned earlier, the need for these digitally um, trained agriculturalists is what I'll call them. Um, and so we're in the process of thinking through how we can train or how we can develop a pilot project um, in which we could develop some sort of curriculum to support coursework, research experiences, or technical or professional skills development. So we're at the stage now where we're fundraising for this particular project. So I would keep our, if this is of interest to anyone, please talk to me afterwards. But we're in the fundraising stage for this particular project. So it's something that we'll announce likely in early next year. Um, but we're in the process of trying to figure out what we're looking for, but we really want to see some interesting projects that can come through where folks are trying to develop pilot projects and how they can encourage um, research and training and mentored opportunities around um, digital agriculture. And I think, ah, haha, -ha, and it's 411. <laughs> so <laughs> for the last four minutes, <laughs> I will tell you guys about my create. I was a member of um, Create IGERT, which was a collaborative research and education in agricultural technology and the engineering program that was a collaboration between Tuskegee University and UC Davis. I'm a graduate of HBCU Tuskegee University, and um, it emphasized uh, integrated doctoral training in plant sciences, molecular bio biology, and engineering. And so, um, as the students earlier talked about how their IGERT experience helped them, I will talk about how my IGERT experience helped me. Um, it was just an amazing opportunity to not only collaborate with another university, but through that IGERT, um, they also had a collaboration with two um, institutions in Ireland. And so I had the opportunity to be a visiting fellow at Chagas in Carlo, um, where I worked on uh, a number of transformational experiments. And then um, I had the opportunity to go to Davis multiple times to collaborate with their scientists and obtain training. So that definitely just expanded my worldview. I'm originally from Alabama, if you can't tell from the accent. Um, and so just having the opportunity to visit another university and see how that university engages is is amazing experience in and of itself and then following that um, I decided that I would love the opportunity to um, 
have an integrative experience. So my degree is actually in integrative biosciences. And when everyone asks what that means, I'm like, ah, oh, it's an umbrella term. It's hard to describe what it means. But I really wanted a program where I didn't have to have a very clear, defined project. I wanted to build my own project. So Tuskegee started an integrative bio, um, biosciences project, and I was in the inaugural class. So with all the challenges of being in an inaugural class. <laughs> but it was very exciting in that I had the opportunity to do a lot of what you guys were discussing today, have co-mentors, have a project where my one mentor was a soil scientist, my other mentor was a molecular biologist, and trying to get them to work together because before my project they had never engaged with each other, they had never worked together. And what I saw was that the integrative biosciences projects um, the program itself and the projects that we came up with were really changing the ways in which um, our faculty work together. Because prior to that, they had no reason to really work together. But because we existed, they had to start to play together in a different way. And that was really exciting to see. Um, it was a lot of work to get everyone to kind of work together in a way that made sense. And a lot of what everyone was saying about how they're like, oh, well, you can have one chapter on their stuff, but you got to get to my stuff. That feels very, that resonated <laughs> because there was a little bit of tug and pull about that. But I feel as though it was such a valuable experience for me because from that, I then left and was a AAAS fellow and went to the USDA and the Biotechnology Regulatory Service where I had the opportunity to use all of those skills. And now I'm at a foundation where I work in soil, water, plants, <laughs> whatever you name it. And so I'm constantly kind of in this integrated space. So I think that one of the things that's so valuable about it is that um, I think being through it, going through an integrated program allows the students options if nothing else right so if they decide to stay at the bench that's awesome that's amazing and that's great but if they ever decide that they would like to try something else i've been in i've been at the bench i've been in government i've been in nonprofit, all in like the six years since i graduated so it's given me this opportunity to kind of go in all these different directions and feel comfortable in all of these different directions because i've always worked in a very collaborative way so I think with that, it is exactly 4.15, and I'm done. <laughs>